Nigeria had had a long-standing commitment in terms of a technical aid call scheme to Africa, Pacifics, and the Caribbeans. Now, the scheme had been on since 1987. But the big question now is, how relevant is this scheme at a time when there are perceived contempt against our nationals abroad? And is this in line with the principle of reciprocity? More so, Nigeria is still facing problems of poverty within our home front. Shouldn't charity begin at home? Now, in our mission to set the record straight, Network Africa goes one-on-one -on -one with the Director General Technical Aid Corps for Africa, Pacifics, and the Caribbeans, Dr. Pius Oshinikomi. Dr. Pius Oshinikomi was also the immediate past special advisor to Mr. President on International Affairs. Why not join us in this dialogue? So now, um, the whole essence of uh, the technical aid call for the Africa, Pacific, and Caribbean, to the common man, it looks so much like an esoteric affair. Could you tell us more? Well, thank you very much, uh, Benga. Uh, I think it is not esoteric in the sense in which you put it. Uh, you will recall that um, Nigeria as a nation has been very, very active in the decolonization of uh, a number of countries in the African continent, especially uh, in the 1970s. Uh, Nigeria was very active in Southern Africa, in the decolonization process in Southern Africa, to the extent that Nigeria uh, ultimately became a nation recognized as a frontline state. Uh, this involved the commitment of men, materials, and, of course, huge amount of money. Uh, over the years, a number of these countries eventually through the process of agitation, uh, internal strife, and what have you, were able to gain independence. Uh, but this was not without the active uh, collaboration and cooperation of Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria was at the center of getting a number of these countries uh, liberated. Now, shortly after independence, a number of these countries were presented with uh, a myriad of development crises. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, their situation could be uh, likened to uh, development tragedy. Uh, they were getting out of uh, the post-liberation uh, strife, and they were also confronted with the need uh, to actually build synergy among the various factions that led to the liberation struggle. This was also in addition to the huge infrastructural grant uh, that was delivered. Uh, to them upon independence. And so, the, the, the major gap in human resource uh, needs of those nations also remained so pivotal as at that time. And it became the order of the day that quite a number of these countries will run to Nigeria asking for financial aid. Now, 25 years back now, is the old scheme of the technical aid call for the Africa, Pacific, and Caribbean still relevant, considering the changing trends and dynamics of international relations? Is this still relevant to Nigeria's foreign policy trust? Uh, let me say categorically that um, there is no aspect of Nigerian foreign policy that is as relevant uh, as the technical aid call, uh, considering the fact that it is also within the ambit of the South-South Corporation. Um, let us put it in perspective. You know that quite a number of countries, even after independence, um, also entered into a lot of internal strife, civil wars here and there, uh, rebel groups trying to upstage uh, sitting governments. And of course, anarchy was almost the order of the day over a long period of time. In Sierra Leone, Nigeria was actively involved, uh, where we lost men, women, of repute, journalists, soldiers, in our effort to try to restore uh, peace and orderliness into the country. Now, the, the, the truth of the matter is that if you look at the totality of this, the singular most important aspect of Nigeria's presence in a number of these African, Caribbean, and Pacific countries is the human element that we deploy to this nation. This is the outward expression of our foreign policy, the physical expression, the physical attestation to our foreign policy. Xenophobic factor is one thing now, but now let's look at the principle of economic reciprocity. Is this well factored in this uh, volunteer mission that's talking about the whole essence of the technical aid call for the Africa, Pacific, and the Caribbean? Now you probably will have looked at it this way. If there had not been this scheme, 
if Nigeria has not been well integrated into the culture, the system of those countries, of course, this factor of xenophobic, xenophobic factor that you identified would have been much more than what uh, you, uh, you have identified. Uh, in other words, this is in spite of the fact that Nigeria is active in those countries. There have been cross-cultural integration. Um, we have been actively involved. But let us put it in this context. What are the factors leading to um, some of these series of attacks on Nigerians? Uh, we need to emphasize the fact that um, uh, there are indeed good Nigerians. They are in abundance. But the few Nigerians that will not do uh, the right things in the right way often provoke a number of these responses. Uh, for example, you discover that um, what happened in Guinea-Bissau was linked to an incidence of uh, kidnapping. Of course, you know that this is um, a major issue that has reared its ugly head that the federal government is trying to battle with uh, in Nigeria. Now, Dr. Piles or Shingu Komi, um, before I let you go in this edition of Network Africa, let's just quickly take an account of stewardship of your tenure when you are the special advisor to Mr. President on international relations. Uh, permit me, I'll be rubbing it in here that you were the special advisor to the Mr. President on international relations. Um, but during your tenure, you were hardly sane. Uh, many will feel that um, government business is something that is strongly linked to visibility because you are holding a public office. Uh, could you tell us why uh, this was so? Well, let me, let me tell you this. Uh, I have had the privilege of being a commissioner for education in my state or no state. And um, uh, you will agree with me that uh, I was visible uh, in the media. Uh, but you must understand the context, of, uh, the context in which your appointment is made. And two, you must also understand the rules governing your appointment. Let me note, with all this sense of responsibility, that foreign policy is indeed a very delicate enterprise. And there are quite a number of participants. In the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for example, uh, when I was special advisor to the president, there were three ministers. In the villa, there are quite a number of experienced ambassadors and foreign policy practitioners who also contribute to the policy process. Now, it is such that as an advisor, even when the outcome of your suggestion is upheld by the president and it becomes a policy issue, you cannot actually lay claim to it because you would not know uh, the totality of the pieces of advice that Mr. President will have gathered to be able to take that decision. Yes, the decision might reflect um, your contribution, but the, the, the processes leading uh, to that outcome might not even agree with the logic through which you come up with that. Two, you must also understand the fact that advisors by nature should only be seen and not be heard your pieces of advice is to your principal, and you cannot claim patrimony over it. He's banned to take it, or he's banned not to take it. Now, when he takes it, he becomes the author. And as a political scientist, I know well enough that in the foreign policy circuit, you are only part of an entire huge process. So now, does Mr. President come back to give you a pat on the back when your advice turns out to be a Midas torch? Well, let me give it to Mr. President that um, uh, apart from the fact that um, he has the father figure, uh, you also find in him a friend, a brother, a mentor. Uh, he's always quick to acknowledge the slightest of your contribution, even though it's not central um, to the totality of decision that he would take. Uh, at every point in time, uh, flying with him, 
sitting at the dinner table with him and sitting at the strategy table with him. It gives you an impression that you have a lot to contribute and that what you have contributed in the past is appreciated. Now that gives you that internal joy that considering the fact that we have 170 million Nigerians, uh, quite a number of people will give up uh, their respective careers to uh, be able to serve at this level. And so if you have the opportunity, uh, Mr. President uh, occasionally looks at you and says, look, uh, well done. You cannot but feel happy. And let me emphasize that uh, Mr. President is fond of doing that always, acknowledging your little contribution and telling you that you can do more. And that is real the tonic. Dr. Piles Oshinikom, it's been a pleasure having you in this edition of Network Africa and also for bringing a lot of insights into the workings of ASOROC because I know that's where it's, it's a privilege being in such an organization and also having an insight into the workings of uh, government in, at the highest level. Thank you very much for coming on this edition of Network Africa. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.